Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house for this time of worship. I want to share a few announcements with you, as you notice in the bulletin. Um, next Sunday, uh, Pastor Cheryl of the ministry team will be with us again and will bring lead in worship and bring the message. And next Sunday also, if you want to get your old car out and shine it up, Rock Branch Church is having a show and shine from 2 to 5, as well as serving ice cream and brownies. And so drive on over with your vehicle and put it out on the grass there in front of the church and enjoy the fellowship. September events are coming up really fast. Uh, remember, our worship time changes on September 5th to 10.15. You don't have to get up so early. And uh, we will have Holy Communion on the 5th of September as well. Our Sunday school will resume its operation on September 12th. We'll have a kickoff and some kind of social uh, event, a potluck or ice cream or something. I'm not sure it's all nailed down yet, but on September 12th to celebrate Sunday school starting off. Um, and the uh, announcements on the back are the ones that we roll over from week to week. Uh, see, with, see the community baskets, donations for September, and take that to heart. Are there any other announcements? The sign-up sheet for helping for the soup and pie is back here. Okay. If you haven't signed up, uh, please. If you'd like to sign up to donate or to volunteer, the sign-up sheet is on the stand in the back for the September 17th UMW Soup and Pie Luncheon. That's homecoming, so um, always a big deal here. Right, I invite you to uh, stand and sing with me as we uh, open our worship with Morning Has Broken. call to worship that is before you. God is here. We will celebrate. Celebrate with joy and pride. And you may be seated. Let us join together in the congregational prayer that's before you on the screen. Let us pray. Father God, we confess our need of you. 
we did not create ourselves. We cannot cause the sun to shine or rain to fall. Our human existence comes from our understanding of you. Purpose and direction and love and hope in life come from knowing you. Thank you for leading us to the fulfillment of our needs and providing Jesus as our guide, strength, and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. It was Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And the hymn is number 369 in the hymn book. It's Blessed Assurance and the words are before you. And I invite you to stand.
I neglected to acknowledge the floral arrangements that are in the sanctuary this morning. They are from the funerals last week of Ginny Sightsinger and Larry Countryman. And we thank the families for leaving these arrangements for our enjoyment at worship today. The scripture lesson for this day is from John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 60 through 69. Jesus has been teaching in the synagogue, and people were having different reactions to what he was saying. And so John records this. Jesus was aware that his disciples were grumbling about it, that is what he had been saying, and asked them, does this shock you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh can achieve nothing. The words I have spoken to you are both spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who have no faith. For Jesus knew from the outset who were without faith and who was to betray him. So he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Your words are words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are God's Holy One. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Chris and Pat were the best of friends. One day, Chris calls Pat and says, Come over here and help me. I have a jigsaw puzzle and I can't figure out how to get it started. And Pat asks, well, what is it supposed to be when it's finished? And Chris says, well, according to the picture on the box, it's a tiger. So Pat stops by to help with the puzzle. Chris shows Pat where the puzzle spread all over the table and Pat studies the pieces for a moment and then looks at the box and turns to Chris and says, first of all, no matter what we do, we're not going to be able to assemble these pieces into anything resembling a tiger. And then says, and then, and then Pat says, well, secondly, let's have a cup of coffee and then... Let's put all these sugar-frosted flakes back in the box. <laughs> I want to talk to you about puzzles. And that's appropriate, I believe, because let's face it, life is puzzling. Relationships are puzzling, and don't I know it. Even faith is puzzling, if it's a mature adult faith. And even the most expert puzzle fan knows that it's much easier to put together the puzzle if you first look at the picture on the box. That's your guide. On the front of the box is this picture, and if you set it up in front of you, you've got some idea of the layout and the color and, you know, the whole scheme of the thing. Helps make sense of those 500 or 1,000 little disjointed puzzle pieces. If someone handed you a box of pieces, you'd drive yourself crazy to make something of them without that picture. It would take forever to sort it out. But with the picture as a guide, you have a fighting chance to make something sensible, even beautiful, out of all those little pieces. There's a story that tells about a little boy who was bothering his father while his dad was reading a magazine. 
father decided to occupy the boy by tearing a page out of the magazine and cutting it into smaller pieces. Gave it to the boy and told him, put this back, put this, put this back together, put this page back together. And he thought this would occupy the boy for a long time, but what he was wrong, because in just a short time, the boy had the page reassembled. And his dad asked how he had done it so quickly. And the boy replied that it was easy. Well, it was easy. There was a picture of a man on the other side, and when I got the man right, everything else fell into place. That's an old story, but it's an important one, especially when we come to the Gospel of John. For the author of John's Gospel has seen the picture on the other side of the piece of paper, and, that is, and it is a picture of Jesus. So life is no longer a random, meaningless jumble of pieces. God has revealed himself through Jesus and is knowable. And that's the message of the book of John. John opens his gospel with this declaration about Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the light of men and women. Two chapters later, John records Jesus' encounter with the elderly Pharisee Nicodemus. And when Nicodemus is slow to comprehend how he as an old man can experience a new birth, a second birth, Jesus blows him away with this promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John has seen the big picture, and he can't stop talking about it. He has found the key to life. Do you want to know the purpose of life? Look to Jesus. Well, in today's scripture lesson, John is writing about a time in Jesus' ministry when the crowds are starting to fade away. They, they are finding Jesus' teachings too demanding, too difficult, too hard to bear. Because Jesus was challenging many of the preconceived notions about faith and about the meaning of life, his ministry, which had once seemed so promising, now seemed to be fading. And Jesus understood what was happening. And he turned to the 12 disciples who had been with him from the beginning, and he says, do you want to leave too? But it was Peter, impetuous, irrepressible Peter, who answers with one of the most beautiful statements in all of Scripture, Lord, to whom do we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Simon Peter knew, as did John, Jesus is the picture on the puzzle box. He is the key to the puzzle of life. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Many of us know the story of St. Augustine. Augustine's mother was Monica. She was a Christian believer. She was married to a Roman who was a pagan. Monica prayed incessantly for her son, Augustine. But if you know anything about Augustine's life, even having, even having been raised as a Christian by his mother, he experimented. He looked at different philosophical teachings. He lived a rather wild life. Augustine was born in 354 AD. And he says in his own words that he, quote, ran wild in a shadowy jungle of erotic adventures. Even though he'd been raised in the church, he like many raised in the church, didn't really internalize a lot of that. But in the summer of 386 AD, Augustine was in a, in a garden, a walled garden. 
and he was waging a spiritual war within himself. He felt so trapped by the sins of his past that he broke down in tears. And he heard a, the voice of a child, a child chanting, pick up and read, pick up and read. And he felt this to be the voice of God. And so he found his Bible, opened it, and began to read. And this is what he, this is what he read from the, Paul's letter to the Romans. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to glorify the desires of the sinful nature. And Augustine writes in his, in his work, I quote, I neither wished nor needed to read further. He would write of his conversion, saying, at once, with the last words of this sentence, it was as if a light of relief from all anxiety flooded into my heart. All the shadows of doubt were dispelled. And the following Easter, Augustine was baptized. His mother, Monica, lived to see her son's conversion and died a few years later, knowing her prayers were answered. You see, Augustine embraced Christ from that moment with such a passion that eventually he was ordained and later became a bishop in the church. His writings have had enormous impact on Western thought and philosophy. Augustine discovered what Peter discovered. The key to the puzzle of life is Jesus Christ, and millions of people of every walk of life have discovered this truth, too, down through the ages. The, picture on the puzzle box is Jesus. When will you discover that truth for yourself? I know I have discovered it. There's a liability to growing up in a Christian environment because it may blind us to Jesus' call He's just so familiar. We've heard about him since we were little. We've been to Sunday school. We've gone to church. We've been through confirmation class. We've joined the church. And, oh, it's just more of the same. But if we lived in a culture that was really hostile to Christian values, we might see the stark difference Jesus' coming has made. Suppose we lived in a culture in which girls counted for so little that girls were killed at birth. Or we lived in a culture where people of other faiths were considered infidels, could be killed at will. Or a culture where you could not help the poor because they were being punished for misdeeds in a prior life. Maybe it is impossible for us to objectively view our own face, but even the standards by which we judge it have been so affected by the coming of Jesus that we just assume the values of love and respect for all people are true because that's how we've been raised. And we were raised that way because of the influence of Jesus. Pandita Ramabi was born in India in 1858. She had a loving family. Her father, ignoring the customs of the day, made a point of educating his wife and his daughter. And Pandita demonstrated great intellectual gifts at a young age. One day in Calcutta, she heard a talk on Jesus, the Messiah who loved and accepted all people, even women. And she became a Christian believer. And in turn, Pandita took upon herself the task of translating the Bible into her native language. It took years of work, and Pandita was old and ailing by the time the rough draft was finished. She was almost through with the proofreading when she became seriously ill. And she prayed to God for 10 more days to finish her work. 
At the end of the 10 days, she finished proofreading her translation of the Bible. And then she quietly died. Pandita discovered what Simon Peter discovered and what Augustine discovered and what Paul discovered and what other giants of the faith discovered and what you and I can discover and that is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. These banners don't hang up here just to cover up the paneling. These banners hang up here to declare that truth that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the key to making sense out of life. You know, there are so many diverse philosophies in the world today. It's a regular smorgasbord. You can pick from this and pick from that and you can blend the two together and then you can put something else on top of it. Newsweek magazine focused on spirituality in America some time back. The author of the lead article makes the point that more and more people today are creating their own religions out of a mix of orthodox and non-traditional practices and beliefs. A number of people were quoted in the article. One was a young woman, a student, getting her doctorate in religion and nature at the University of Florida. The article's author noted that this young woman's idea of worship consists of composting, recycling, and a daily five-mile run. Well, I hope that works for you, but I have my doubts. From all the evidence I've seen, no alternative faith offers anything that is even close to the power of the words of Jesus. And when Peter turned to Jesus and said, Lord, to whom do we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter nailed it. He put it together the missing pieces. You know, and that's why we've gathered here in worship. We haven't come because, well, it's our tradition. That's what we do on Sundays. We haven't come to see our friends specifically. We haven't come to enjoy the music. But all of these are important. And we like the, that part of our coming together as the church. But if any of these are the one critical reason you're here today, you're probably not going to have a truly uplifting experience. Such reasons for worship reveal that our religion is more theory than a love affair. I hope you're here because you have a love affair with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I hope you're here because you have found that Jesus has the words of eternal life. Malcolm Muggeridge accompanied a film crew to India in order to narrate a documentary on the late Mother Teresa. He already knew she was a good woman or he wouldn't have bothered going. When he met her, he found a good woman who was also very compelling, so very compelling that he titled his documentary Something Beautiful for God. When he remarked to Mother Teresa on the fact that she went to Mass every day at 4.30 a.m., she replied, if I didn't meet my Master every day, I'd be doing no more than social work. So I hope you are here this day to meet Jesus. I hope you're not here for some other reason. I hope you're here to listen to Christ's words for your life. I hope you find what John, Peter, Augustine, Pandita, Mother Teresa found. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. I hope each of you know that. May it be so. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity always to come together as the community of faith. As we come into your presence, into this space, may we sense that Jesus is here 
and maybe look to him because he has the words of eternal life. And so, Lord, we open our hearts and our minds once again to the teaching of your Spirit that it may lead us into a fuller and more gratifying walk with Jesus. And so we ask your blessing upon us and upon all who are part of our fellowship and those who aren't present this morning as well. We pray that uh, you be with those who have great needs. We think of the sick, those that are shut in, those that are hospitalized, for the rising number of children who are being affected by the virus. Lord, we pray for those health workers, doctors, nurses, who continually minister to the sick. We pray, Lord, for uh, those who sorrow, for the Zeitzinger family, for the Countryman family, and pray that you will surround them with your watchful care. We pray for our military men and women. We pray for the situation in Afghanistan, chaos, danger, imminent threats of harm and death. We pray for our military, Lord, especially those who are in tense, difficult situations. And we pray for our country, divided and angry, confused. We know that this is a land that you have blessed, and we continue to pray that your hand will be upon our country. And so be with us, and may your hand rest upon us as we go about our tasks for the rest of this day and this week. Be with us and lead us and guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We present our gifts and offerings to God. <coughs> number 600 in the hymnal, Wonderful Words of Life, and the words are before you. Sweetly 
echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. <clears throat> Peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. And now remember, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Go in peace.